Nice to see you, Dona Carla. Estou muito feliz que a senhora está de volta na Terra. Também. You know, I'm very happy that she's back in town. Oh. Carla, my name is Millie Guzman Young, and I'm the university assistant here. Thank you for joining us. My name is Martin Reina, I'm a student worker. <clears throat> my name is Cynthia Zuniga, and I'm a student worker here. I'm Katie, I'm a graduate assistant here. Uh, I'm Isabelle, I also work here. <laughs> I'm Mariana, I'm a student worker here. In other words, I have to pay them to show up. <laughs> And this online is Gladys Moreno Fuentes, one of our uh, counselors in the student wellness department. Nice to meet you, Carla. Nice to meet you all. Thank you so much. It looks like everybody's having a nice lunch right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be um, with some point. Isabelle. Okay, I'm going to introduce Carla Silva. So, first, welcome. <clears throat> Okay, Carla Silva is a director of Relay Graduate School of Education and Educative Pr Preparation Program Partnership in Connecticut and Rhode Island. Silva is a Brazilian native. She holds a double bachelor, bachelor's in Portuguese and literature from the Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She also received a Master's of Arts in International Studies and Human Rights from the University of Connecticut in 2014 and is currently a doctoral student in the Educational Leadership Program and at the University of Harvard. Uh, Silva has worked in higher education in instructional as well as administ administrative roles for over 16 years. At CCSU, she taught Portuguese and International Studies class from 2006 to 2012. Her current research interests are anti-racist pedagogies and counter narratives in the K-12 and undergraduate classrooms. Welcome. Well, thank you, thank you. Wow, it has been that long that I thought I sent you, huh? I know. I know. So first, could you tell us a little bit about your background, like where you're from, all the things that you've been through? Absolutely. Um, uh, well, I, as Isabelle, intro, right, intro, you know, I, I was, I, I love how she like shake her, <laughs> put her fist up uh, because I'm from Brazil. I'm from the state of Rio, um, but I'm not, Carioca, as we call it, people that are from Rio, because I'm from the state. So, like, I'm from, like, a, as we call, interior, like, the, like a small city called Petrópolis. The city itself, I could tell you all day uh, the stories of the city. Um, so, gorgeous. I grew up. I'm sorry? It's gorgeous. It is very gorgeous. It's, it was colonized by, 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 German is not necessarily Portuguese. Uh, so if you go there, it's kind of like a little Germany, like the, the architecture is, is, is cold for Brazilian standards, not for Connecticut standards, but for Brazilian standards, kind of cold is in the mountains, very different from the picture you have in your head about Rio. It's very, no beach, it's cold, a lot of old people, uh, and <laughs> not fancy like Rio. So. Um, but I moved to Rio when I, uh, during my undergraduate years. Um, I, I I was there for quite uh, some time until I moved here. So I moved here to the U.S. in 2002. And here's a funny story. I was a teacher in Brazil. I was a Portuguese teacher, a literature teacher, right? The equivalent of an English teacher in the U.S. So I thought, when I moved here, I thought, oh, I can teach here. I've been teaching in Brazil my whole life. Even before I graduated from college, I, I was like teaching, right? Little did I know that it's not that simple. You just don't move here and start teaching. You're a foreigner. You have an accent. You don't have the credentials, quote unquote, that they expect from you. So it wasn't 
easy like I thought, right? Um, in fact, I couldn't find jobs. Uh, and I started to like volunteer while I waited for my paperwork. I came with a fiance visa <laughs> and I couldn't work actually. So I, I started to do volunteer jobs. And then once I have authorization to work, documentation to work, um, I couldn't find jobs. I just couldn't find jobs. I mean, it was, it was interesting because I try to, I try to apply for things like, uh, I, I forgot the name of the, it's like company and homemakers. I think that's the name of the company. Is that? A thing? And homemakers. Oh, that's what it is. And they would look at my resume and they'll be like, oh, you're overqualified. We only pay $7 an hour. Guys, I'm talking about like 10 years ago. I'm not talking about recently. And they'll be like, but you're overqualified. But then I would apply for jobs that I thought was qualified and they would say I'm, I'm underqualified. So all of that, Less than for a minute, I found a job as like a paraeducator, my, but my, my accent was so strong that even though I passed all the practice exam, whatever like exam they, they would tell me to pass so that I could be qualified and certified as a paraeducator, I did. And they still wouldn't put me in a classroom because they didn't think, you know, they, they say like you have broken English, this and that. I'm sharing this really hard beginning with you to show you like um, how hard it is to, to prove yourself when you come right, fresh from another country with a really strong accent. And people very often get <clears throat> confused your accent and your foreign degree with um, your intellectual, right? Like capacities, which have, as we all know here, have nothing to do with anything. In fact, my university in Brazil is very prestigious. Very few people even get into the university. In Brazil, yeah. I would show my diploma and people would be like, oh, you were from, but here nobody knew. Well, nobody I cared. Knew. Well, you knew, you knew, Marianne. Thank God you knew. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Yeah, and so it took me a while to be seen as a capable individual with, uh, in, in Marianne has everything to do with that shift in my life because I was, no. I, at certain point, at certain point, I was like, okay, I guess I moved here and I chose at the time to marry this gringo. So everybody's always going to see me as like, oh, you just, you just wanted to marry this guy and come here, right? Like nobody really took me serious professionally speaking. So I kind of like, started to accept my fate until I uh, met this um, Brazilian woman um, who had a Brazil center and say, hey, do you want to teach Portuguese to some of the Americans that, that are always looking to, you know, they, they always come here, they want to learn Portuguese, would you like to teach them? I say, yeah, you know, sure. So it's like some extra income. And in that place, the Brazil Culture Center is uh, is how I met Marianne, and Marianne was like, uh, you, you have a diploma from UFA Hijata, you should come teach at Central. And that really, I feel like my career, because I had, up until then, I had little jobs, but not a career here. I had a career in Brazil, but not here. And it wasn't until I started teaching at Central that my career began, you know. And we had at that point a grant from the federal government that was um, an exchange that provided an exchange program with two Brazilian universities. And we didn't have anybody who could teach the students who were going to Brazil any Portuguese. Right. And it was um, it was just the situation was kind of desperate because we couldn't we had students interested in going, but <laughs> they couldn't <laughs> or write any Portuguese at all, which, you know, you can't really put someone without any of the language into a, you know, a college classroom. Yeah. And, and Carla really helped <clears throat> us out there. You, oh, it was you, a win-win. I enjoy, um, 
You have yeah, I work at the mother languages department, but well, officially, but I helped. So I, I taught some Portuguese classes through the mother languages. But thanks to Marianne with the study abroad um, programs that she would run every summer, I got to also teach international studies classes. Yeah. Right. So that I could not only students would be prepared by knowing a minimum of like, because they only had like, they, they have a few, like maybe a semester or two to try to learn Portuguese. But then we started to offer international studies classes so they could also have a notion about Brazil, Brazilian like culture, because obviously Marianne covered the history and why not, but I got to also share a little bit of, um, you know, culture that related to what they were learning of Marianne. So it was, it was a lot of fun for me. But then she left us and went and got a master's degree at UConn and got hired, yeah, in Austin, Texas to run the, one of the most important Brazilian studies programs in the world at the University of Texas at Austin. And she went away. And then- Oh, Marianne, stop being dramatic. It wasn't that fast. Everyone, it wasn't that. <laughs> I stayed at Central for as long as I could. Marianne really helped. Um, if you remember, so a little context when I started teaching at Central and working with Marianne, Brazil, there were a lot of promising things happening in Brazil as well in the country, right? So we were about to uh, host two major events at the time. Uh, the World Cup, the Olympics, um, and just Brazil was just booming under under Lula's uh, right. So like, so people were more and more interested about Brazil than ever. So those I was so very lucky. It was a great timing to be teaching Portuguese and why not? And like I remember when I said in the beginning that Central. And this connection, Marianne, and, and me teaching at Central opened a lot of doors for me outside of what I was doing. I was working K to 12 as my like main job, but then I started to teach just as like for fun, really. Um, and but eventually, other people start to hear about me, and other institutions start to contact me, contacting me to see if I could teach there too. One of them was Yale. And you, you might know Marianne has connections with Yale because Marianne got her. Not so much her. <laughs> yes, you do, miss. So Yale, someone at, at the Macmillan Center. So it's like a, so Yale has a Spanish and Portuguese department. So they, they have Portuguese teachers there, professors, right? Like very prestigious professors and why not? But they also have a Latin American center. And the person there at the time in charge of the center contacted me, not the other way around, saying, hey, we would like to offer Portuguese for high schoolers in New Haven, in the New Haven area, as like, you know, university credits. Uh, but we would like to also create a curriculum for our forestry students, our graduate students in the forestry school. Uh, they are traveling to Brazil. They're interested in environmental issues in Brazil and they already know Portuguese. They don't wanna go to the Portuguese Spanish department to learn Portuguese. They are more interested in having stimulating conversations with someone who in Portuguese so they can get their Portuguese right, like more fluent, but also someone that can talk to them about Brazil political issues and this and that. Would you like to create a curriculum for us? We pay you and would you like to teach? I had no idea how to even start, but I say, yes, it's Yale, duh, but sure. 
Um, so then I, I had to create two curriculums, one for the high schoolers and one for the PhD students. And at that point, I didn't even have a master's. All I have was a bachelor's degree from UFRJ. And so, so that was a great experience. I was still teaching at Central. I didn't stop teaching at Central. I was just doing those things. And I realized when I started teaching those um, graduate students at Yale, I say, my goodness, look at me. I'm here teaching overachiever students. <laughs> <laughs> who like I'll, I'll give them an assignment and they will come with five different things and I'm like guys I, I didn't ask you for all of this <laughs> like what do you do like you ask them for an essay they'll give you like an essay a, a report or like you know so it was so much fun and I say you know I, I think it's time for me to seek um to further my education because look at me I'm at Yale teaching graduate students. I don't even have a master's and that's what led me to look for a master's um and and um and i ended up at uconn because they offered me full scholarship and so i ended up there that's how i ended up at uconn but then things got just as a graduate as as most of you are graduate students right no -uh. no i graduate um I'm a well, graduate student and the rest are graduandos. Okay, okay. Well, as as an adult, so at that time I was already on my 30s. I had two daughters under the age of I believe six at the time. So like I had two, I had toddlers. Um and a very right, like tough schedule. So to become a graduate student, I also got a scholarship to become a full-time graduate student. So I had to just let go of Central and Yale to be able to dedicate my time to the graduate program and still be able to be a mother to two toddlers. Um, and that's why I had to leave Central uh, in 2012 because that was the year that I entered the master's uh, program. Then uh, Marianne saying, oh, and then she moves to Texas. That's because once I had my master's, I was like, okay, I think um, it's time for me to transition from classroom instructor to administrative positions right and so I applied to several places around and was not even called to interview uh Texas uh the University of Texas at Austin was one of the few places that I had interviewed and when I got there it was like I knew that that was like my dream job because like Marian said um it is very prestigious um, Brazil center. I tr and uh, and um, when I was there in person, they flew me there, and I got the minute that I got out of the airplane. I kid you not, I'm like, oh my god, I need to move here because it was warm. <laughs> it was nice and warm, and everybody was just so nice. Um, and I just thought, oh my God, how am I, how am I gonna convince my then husband to move all the way across Texas? Um, it was hard, it was hard to convince him, but eventually it did. <laughs> it was just a shift, a good, a big shift in my career. And, I, and I'm so glad I did that, so glad I did that. So what did you do? Um, like, what was your job actually? Um, in Texas, Carla. Okay, so, so the University of Texas is a system, right? They have University of Texas in different places. The one I work at is the University of Texas in Austin. And that particular uh, one has the Latin American Studies Institute called LILAS, is the Lausanne Long Institute of Latin American Studies. And LILAS has, within the institution, the institute, they have two centers, academic centers, they're not cultural centers. 
One is the Mexico Center and the other one is the Brazil Center. And they put me in charge of the Brazil Center. But again, is it was different than anything I'd done in the past because as the director of the Brazil Center, I had very new responsibilities that I have to learn, right? Um, so for example, we had several grants that I had to manage from uh, grants that you probably heard of all the way to grants that were just particular to that institution. And those grants had to do with research that, that were related to Brazil. So some of them were transnational research, meaning professors at UT Austin collaborating, doing research with Brazilian scholars in Brazil, right? And so they had this one grant that they share and I was the one that had to manage. What does that mean? It means like they have to submit me like a budget of where they plan to spend and and then I had to kind of like manage for them. Okay, from, from very annoying and tedious things such as like submit paperwork and even do IRB for them in both languages. I had to I do IRB um, in English for the University of Texas. And then I had to submit an IRB in Portuguese for the Brazilian institution. So they won't know what an IRB is. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, sorry? <laughs> no, no. Millie knows what it is, but the rest don't. Okay. So IRB, um, basically when you're doing research with human subjects, right, there's some ethics involved, right? You can't just go and do whatever you want, decide, oh, I'm going to investigate how homeless people do this or that, like, there's some ethics involved when you are researching over human subjects. And so you sort of have to go to this bureaucratic re board that reviews your research, takes a look of what you intend to do, how you intend to do, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, even like what are the questions you're intending to ask that individual and they approve or not uh, is very hard and annoying to do most people don't like to do that but it's very necessary to protect right those individuals that you plan to work with that's what irb more or less is and uh the thing is it's already complicated but when you do a research transnational research in which you're dealing with individuals here individuals in the other country um you have to actually submit just say we didn't change anything so do uh uh paperwork in different languages and different countries have different rules and why not. And so my, one of my jobs was to ensure that also, because if we don't get approval, if you don't get approval, if you are receiving a grant, you're not going to get any money either. So you, those are things you have to do before you go to the field, before you go do a re, your research. So other than that, I also, it, the fun part of my job is like sometimes we would receive Brazilian scholars. So it was my job to uh, bring them, uh, create classes that they could teach as visiting scholars. Same thing with we were sending a UT Austin faculty to Brazil. I also got to receive students from Brazil. I was in charge of the um, study abroad in Brazil. I brought students to Brazil. I used to go to Brazil with them. What else? Um, and so all the Brazilianists, so the scholars who are experts in Brazil, like Professor Mahoney, we call them Brazilianistas, right? Brazilianists. So I was like the main point between the University of Austin and Brazilianists. So if they would like to even apply for like a full bride scholarship, I, um, for example, I'll help them with that um, application. And I would invite them to do talks. Uh, I was doing like, um, uh, 
all kinds of events, all, 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 all kinds of events um, and supporting them if they had ideas for like events and things of that nature. It was all me, but it sounds like a lot, but it was fun. Th those are not things there I, I had to learn, but um, it was, I was just so excited. It was my, it was my choice to be there. I was, I was, I worked there for five years and oh my gosh, I learned so much and I made some lots of connections, networking. Um, in a nutshell, it was a great experience for me. I just want to stop talking because I feel like I'm talking so much and <laughs> you're back in Connecticut, Aunt Carla? I am back in Connecticut. So in 2018. End of 2018, uh, I moved back, and and then in 2019, I start working for this um, program for this organization that I work now, Relay. Um, and then yeah, and then COVID hit us all. Yeah. Have you noticed the uh, growth of the Brazilian community, especially in Connecticut? Have you, like these past few years, how many Brazilians we are getting here? Have you noticed? I have not noticed. This is a great question. When Before I moved to Texas, I was very in tune with the Brazilian community and including demographics uh, because it was part of like my interest. I work with, right, like the, 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 um, the Brazilian community because of the Brazil Center, because of my connection with Central and Yale. But once I moved to Texas, that kind of like, right, it was not on my radar anymore. And, and when I returned right away, we like, right, like after one year and I was just focusing on getting a job anywhere, uh, I, I really didn't have the time to reconnect with the community. And so to be very honest, no, I have no clue. Other than, you know, I go to Park Street, I, I go to, uh, in the Hartford area, I still know people, I, I get to meet with them sometimes, but I have no idea. Because I came uh, from Brazil a couple of years ago. When I first came, there was not many, I mean, there was a lot of Brazilians, but not as many as we have it now. And I don't know when you came, you came uh, by yourself or you came with your family? No, I came by myself. I came with a fiance visa. I was engaged to my soon to be husband uh, at the time when I arrived. Um, I'm not, well, five years later, I got my citizenship. Um, but all my family, my immediate family, live in Brazil. I only have my two daughters here now. I see, because uh, when I came, I came with my brother. And when you, when we first got here, we lived in Hartford. Like you were talking about Park Street. So the only Brazilian uh, connection that we had is like when we went to church in Park Street. But now, whenever like you walk around in Hartford, Danbury, like you hear people talking Portuguese and you know it's Portuguese from Brazil. And there's a lot of uh, young people now here that come from Brazil to, uh, they start like going to school and all that, but then they soon go to work, like construction and house cleaning and all that. And that was one of the first things that I mentioned to Dr. Mahoney when I got here, because in my high school, I was the only Brazilian. And before I graduated, there was only one more Brazilian there. And after after I graduated, many Brazilians started going to my high school and all that, but- What was your high school? Uh, Crack ASI, uh, Academy of Science Innovation. Here in New Britain. Yeah, in New Britain. in New Britain. Yeah, and one thing that I mentioned to Dr. Mahoney <clears throat> that I'm always worried about, because most of the Brazilian uh, community, people, even my family, even my parents, is always like, they we come here with the mentality, oh, we're gonna go to school and graduate and all that. However, when we get here, it's all about work. And I mentioned to Dr. Mahoney when I first got here, I was like, it's so sad that all my friends, my Brazilian friends, never make out of high school. 
all of them uh, always focus on uh, work and making money. And many of them don't even know that they could go to school and go to college and all that. And I was wondering uh, if you have ever like have a interaction uh, with someone like that or you went to that, like. Right, well, my experience, well, when I moved here, I was already 20, about to turn 25. I already had a degree. So I came as an adult pretty much, right? So very different experience from the one that you're describing of you, right? Your experience and your brother's experience. So I came as an adult, ready to work, not concerned with studying, but because I, like I share with you all, because I wasn't given opportunities to work on my field, I had to come back. I felt like I had to come back at some point to, to earn a degree here to be taken serious, right? but it was late in life. So I wouldn't be able to tell you the landscape right now, but when I first moved here and I worked with Brazilians because of the Brazil Culture Center in Hartford, which was on Park Street, what my experience at that time and for five years, more or less, six years maybe, I would see that Brazilians that moved there were mostly undocumented and not at all concerned with building a life here because they their goal was exactly that which is to be here temporarily make some money come back to brazil and when they had small children with them most of them had small children not teenage uh teenage uh daughters and and, and sons when they 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 would definitely put those kids on school. They knew they could, and the, the kids were to school. And the kids, many times, they uh, they were the ones that helped the parents, like with the English. They were like official translators of their right for their parents, and they would understand a little bit more of how things operate. So they kind of had that double job of translating and educating their own parents about certain things. I don't, I don't recall seeing those kids growing up and, uh, old, and to become old enough to go to high school because at some point the parents would leave and take them with them. That, that was what I recall. Very different from what you uh, and, I mean. Yeah, and one thing that happened, Carla, in some ways while you were gone, right? Um, in 2008, Brazil opened the 2007, 2008, Brazil opened the consulate in Hartford because there were so many Brazilians in the region. But then with the economic crisis here and Brazil doing so well, lots of Brazilians went back to Brazil. At one point, I heard something like 30,000 Brazilians leaving the Northeast every week to go back to Brazil. And so the, and at the same time, remember there was that um, uh, murder uh, in the Park Street area and, right, right. Um, the ICE and, and the police just kind of descended on Park Street looking for the, for whoever had killed someone and it was supposedly an undocumented Brazilian. And so lots of Brazilians just fled that whole neighborhood, yeah? But since Bolsonaro's, right, um, since the situation got so difficult in Brazil, Right, the populate right the Brazilian population in Connecticut has started to grow again mm. a lot. That right? that makes so much sense. Yeah. So people came back, um, but there were people who I remember one day meeting the niece of someone I know in Brazil. She was a waitress at a Portuguese restaurant on Park Street. I'm like, what? You know, Joan Messner and I, Joan Messner, yeah, Joan Messner and I were there having lunch and the waitress was like, how do you speak Portuguese? And we start, you know, that conversation. And, and um, so the, you know, the population is kind of going up and down, but the two cultural centers are gone. 
there were two cultural centers on Park Street and the directors of each one of them, <laughs> they didn't care for each other, let's put it that way. <laughs> and, 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 and during from like 2016 with the impeachment of Jilma until quite recently, it's been a little difficult for some of us to connect with the Brazilian community because they tend to be very conservative. Yes. Or yes. At least I'm so know. glad that you mentioned that the timeline you provided makes total sense to me. That during right the Lula administration, things were bad in Brazil, therefore people moved there. Wouldn't have to right. That makes a lot of sense. But I there think it also explains there and so they went back. Right. It explains so much. But also you're so right when it comes to this new, I mean, Bolsonaro won um, in the United States, didn't he? Amongst the, the people, the Brazilians that vote in the country, Bolsonaro won the last election, this, this last election, election. So yeah, it is fair to say most Brazilians uh, are Bolsonaro, outside, you know, outside Brazil are uh, Bolsonaro, so that it's kind of like a contradicting, right? Like you are Bolsonaro, but you live in Brazil because things are not good there, <laughs> and you come here, yeah, you vote for for the guy. It's kind of like, hmm, hmm, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and I try, I've been trying to reconnect with the Brazilian community, but because they aren't right, those the bridge right I, I feel like the culture center as much as the two ladies from the two different culture centers didn't like each other very much they were able to each on their own create some right create like um community and right like yeah, and, and that's how we met that's right we there you go and so i'm very sad that this is not happening anymore because yeah you have the restaurants and Right, you have the small businesses that kind of like people go to, like the, the Brazilian ha the hair salon or the whatever, but it's different. A culture it's center. Like it's oh, I, I, I go there. I go there still. I go no, there. I know. Oh, well, those small, small businesses, everybody knows me on, on those businesses. Park Street. I'm there all the time. Park so Street, good. Park Road. Park Street. What is the name of the owner? Uh, what's her name? Eliani? What about? Eliani? Yeah, Eliani is the owner, but she, most people don't don't know her. Oh, well, because if it's the one like right next to the church, no, is it? No. On the left, like is that, there's a, the Brazilian cafe. Uh, no, it's not the it's not the Brazilian cafe. It's before then. Yeah, like uh. Where's the uh, the uh, Villa Brasil, and then all the way from the liquor store, there's a, like a right. It's right next to the liquor store that burned. Yeah. Is it the same? Isn't the same sidewalk that you're talking same about, Villa Brasil? Same sidewalk. You have like La Estrella, right? By the way, the La Estrella closed. I'm oh, so sad. What, what closed? La Estrella is like a. Oh yeah, the bakery. bakery. Yeah, uh, so you have in the same sidewalk, you have Villa Brasil, you have some Brazilian like clothes store, fashion stuff. And if you keep walking, then that's the Brazil Grill, which was the first one that I remember opened in that neighborhood, like the Brazilian store that opened in the neighborhood uh, with them. It wasn't a Brazil Grill. I remember it was like a grocery store. That's yeah. so Brazilian food. There's a new one they open. Continue Jimenez over yep. there too. Yep. Oh, I love. I go to all the. I hate going to Hartford because it's hard. I have to stop in every single thing and buy a bunch of things I don't need and all they that sugar stuff. <laughs> I I still sometimes I go to the hair salon that they have in there now in front of La Estrella. I forgot the name. Uh, yeah, I try to connect with Brazilians as much as I can, but it's really hard now with, because the first thing they ask you is, 
are you a Lula or a Bolsonaro? Like they want to, they're ready to fight you. <laughs> that I'm out of Harper. I since went well, high school. Yeah, like three years ago, four years ago. But I don't know why. I think maybe because there's so many Brazilians there. Every time I feel like um uh sufocada. Because I, where I live, there's no Brazilians at all, and uh -huh. I only talk Portuguese with when I call my brother, or my mom. So when I feel like Sufocado or whatever, I always go to Hartford, to that little area, go to Villa Brasil, have a, like a lunch or whatever there. It kind of make me connect back to my culture, even though it's not Brazil. It's kind of like you see so many people, like you know their face, you know they are talking your language. I don't know, just make. It makes me feel comfortable right. in a way. Yeah, I have to one, so she has to go. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, but just to address, yeah, I, I, a couple of things that I've done when I moved here, I felt exactly what you're describing: the isolation, that feel, the, the feeling of, oh my God, I don't belong anywhere because clearly I don't belong here. Everybody tries to remind me every minute that they don't understand what I'm saying or right? Don't give me chances. Uh, and I barely have any, know any Brazilians. And just one of the things I remember doing right away was finding a capoeira class to be part of it. Like I that's how I found out about the Brazil center, actually, because I wanted to take capoeira because mm -hmm. I didn't even do capoeira in Brazil. It's just because I wanted to hear Portuguese. I wanted to be able to, to write like, because in capoeira, you sing in Portuguese, the movements are in Portuguese. And, and that culture center really helped me with that, right? Like that need of being around my people. And it's very unfortunate that there isn't something like that anymore for people like you, Isabel. But maybe something for us to think about. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I have wanted us to have capoeira here on campus for a long time. And it always gets moved down the to-do list somehow. <laughs> Start a capoeira mm. class. Well, we needed. There, was a, there were capoeira. There were, oh, I, I, I know instructors. I remember when I was, when I was, when I taught in Essential, I, I was the faculty that would sign and approve like the capoeira club there. There was a capoeira and there was a jiu-jitsu club at Central. Okay. Well, there's still jiu-jitsu. There's three jiu-jitsu back up. Right. But well, capoeira. if you, if you want to make it happen, the capoeira, I, I can talk to my instructor we can we can make it happen <laughs> it's just that before it used to be that the people like a student at central right has to be in charge sort of of the club because it's a student club well the other thing is we can get student activities through the the um um SLD? no through the gym right you know, to just make it a regular class that's how it was. Yeah. But you don't have to have a club to do that. You just need oh, to get Oh, you don't have to have a club. Okay. Well, um, well, I want to say it has been a pleasure. I want to apologize once again for not being there in person like I initially had planned. Um, there's a family hospitalization that I'm dealing with currently, but it has been such a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I hope to maybe be able to visit informally, just visit Marianne, visit you all. Uh, and I'm, I am more than open to help with um, bringing some Brazilian culture back to Central, such as the Capoeira thing, but anything else that we can think about, um, I would love to, I told, I told Dr. Mahoney that I would love to connect and do things again. And it's actually two, former students of Carla's and mine that put us back together. They That's were still, <laughs> so she and I had lost touch when she came back. She's like, I'm here. And I'd be like, okay, well, let's do something. And then we'd be like, she wouldn't, I would, you know, and, and so Nicole Haroy, who's now um, an attorney in the immigration system at the federal courthouse, and Jelena Adams, who um, 
uh, works. Choice for Social Security. Social Security were both still in charge, in touch with both of us. And the next thing you know, we now have this group of people together. It's really kind of fun. I am so happy. Yeah, this is such a fun group. I'm so glad that we reconnected, Marianne. Yeah, we are neighbors, by the way. We live very close. Yeah, to she lives around the corner from me, pretty much. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, like, what do you mean you live in? What you live where? She's like, well, you still do you still live over there, Marianne? I'm like, yeah. Well, oh, I live right over we're there. We're neighbors. We basically I neighbors. I drive by her house twice a day, or I drive by the corner of her street twice. A day. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let's plan something. I would love to visit Central soon, and um, create something so that you know people like Isabel, Isabel can feel that connection again of the Brazilian culture. And we have lots of people interested in Portuguese, and, and it's due. It's thanks to her. Oh, so, at least in part. Well, great job. If you're looking for instructor, okay. I don't have time, but I can figure out. <laughs> I have zero time, but we can always figure out something. Okay. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you for Ciao. See you. Bye.